Hotep. Good evening. I love you too. Microphone here. Okay, great. It is uh, truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to. Uh, can't hear? Who can't hear? Well, it's a bunch of empty chairs up there. Get on down here then. Come on, I got time. Come on. But I think when I get excited and you get excited, it'll get loud enough. There we go. Thank you, brother. Oh, I won't even it. Just get it. Again, it is a pleasure to have this opportunity to share a few words uh, with uh, the brothers and sisters here at the Slave Theater. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Uh, I remember when Gus Savage was here and uh, when he came back to Chicago, uh, we had a very... Uh, good discussion. Uh, he was very proud to have been here. He was excited. Uh, he spoke uh, very highly of the Slave Theater, and it was a pleasure to bump into Attorney Maddox. Uh, I remember I was at that radio station, and uh, it was getting off into the time that I was to come on, and the people I was with were saying, come on, brothers, we need to go on in there and get on. And I said, no, this is a good brother. If he's speaking, if he's speaking, it's like me speaking, so we won't lose any content in terms of giving the people some of the things they deserve. No question. I'd like to thank uh, uh, those uh, uh, people who uh, had to do some of the things to see to it that I got here. Uh, it is not easy uh, trying to bring uh, uh, this type of information. Uh, one of the most odd things about uh, being fired in 88 uh, was the question of where did he get these sources from? And I know us so well, I always go out and get good white sources because we love the white people, so uh, we want to say what? We want to say what happened and who done it. I'll give you some good white quotes so you can go back and tell them that we read them well. And by reading them well, we're able to use the things that they tell about each other. You see, when you're running the world and you're kicking a lot of ass, it ain't no fun unless you're telling somebody else you're doing it. And even though they have secret societies to put off, they're still humans and their weakness as humans is, is that they'll tell. They know the same about you. You do something, especially something that no one should know, you'll tell. Too often, happenstantially, we let people jerk us into telling things that have no business being discussed publicly. I remember being at a conference this weekend, Malcolm X conference, where Europeans were welcome. Well, there's no problem about that as long as we can pass a resolution and say don't nobody give no hold cards while the Europeans in the room. That's all right, then talk general. So we had a general discussion. There's nothing wrong with that if you can get the clarity. But the signal is we don't operate like that. Some of the people that didn't want me here are some of the most militant, worldwide, capitalist, imperialist fighting Negroes who are so militant they want to integrate the revolutionary struggle. And I know which ones they are, and all over the place, they Jewish friends call and say, now, nigga, if you want the money, you can't have Coakley. So I'm glad to be here where they can't have And then when I get to talking, you'll see why. See, I believe that we should earn our way uh, by the brothers and sisters here extending to me this opportunity. Then I have the right to earn the respect that I seek from you so we can go forward to deal on the people that will be identified. Part of what I do, my little contribution, is to clarify who done it. Now, don't nobody want to get down to who done it because they're too busy giving you that tip in such a descriptive way about how they did it, but when they get down to who done it, don't nobody want to play that. See, you don't get paid when you name the names. Now, we love white people so much that we don't think we're going to believe nobody unless the white people didn't hurt them. See, the suspicion is, well, brother, you naming them names, then you must be them. And the perception is, is that unless they're stopping you, that somehow it must be something wrong with you. And the illusion is, is that the white man is so powerful that he has control over everything, and he does not. Yeah. You know, we just left a, a program. We had a program last Wednesday night in Washington, D.C., uh, myself and Brother Zach Kondo and uh, Brother Dr. Jesse McDade. And uh, we had a dialogue about Malcolm X. And you know, we've been to a whole lot of Malcolm X dialogues, and everybody got the books, and everybody got the tapes. And Mel uh, uh, Malcolm, of course, is left as a military reflection. Uh, he is one of the most militant images in our community as a dead man than any living person. No one 
whether it be Marcus Garvey, even Elijah Muhammad, Noble Drew Ali, are known in a military sense, though they all had, in some senses, militaries, the perception of Malcolm is that of military, of fighting. And it's still being held so and true today. Now, the reality is that the Malcolm thing is really unresolved as far as I'm concerned because some things are going on I don't understand. See, it appears as if the reason that we keep getting kicked in the ass is that we don't deliver retribution. Retribution. Red is retribution. And we need to say retribution versus reparation because some people are in movements to appeal to the whites that somehow the whites can pay them some money to make them forgive what they've done. There's nothing a white man can pay me to make me forgive all that he's done. I see only one way to resolve his problem, and that's that he should leave now. There'll be no trouble. <laughs> but you know, the retribution question has to be looked at carefully. We have to analyze what they're saying when they're saying it. Now, I'm sure a lot of people read the autobiography of Malcolm X, but don't really know what it said. There's one page in here I thought was the most important page of the whole book, and it has something to do with Malcolm's death. Too often it's misunderstood and not looked at in a way that we can understand it. Now many people don't know that in this book, in the epilogue section of the autobiography of Malcolm X, is Alex Haley's confession that he informed on Malcolm. So you've got to understand the roots of roots. And the problem is that Alex Haley is living and Malcolm X is dead. And in a particular page, and I'll read you the page so you can go back and peek it for yourself. Page 418, in the epilogue, which Alex Haley alludes to as his only portion of the book that he would write without Malcolm's approval. And in it, it says, in Washington, D.C. and New York City, at least powerful civic, private, and government agencies and individuals were keenly interested in what Malcolm X was saying abroad and were speculating about what he would say and possibly do when he returned to America. In upstate New York, I received a telephone call from a close friend. Well, Alex Haley, tonight at the Slave Theater, the people asked that you name the person that called you from the powerful civic, business, and political leaders. Give us the name of the one that called you to say, come up to New York and tell those big, rich, white people everything you know about what Malcolm is doing. You see, in our community, we must cut off idle dialogue about what the key players are doing to people who are not on the field. Don't get caught bringing them whites in, because we're closing the door. Don't get caught being the one bringing them in. Oh, let's go. In upstate New York, I received a telephone call from a close friend who said he had been asked he asked me if I would come to New York City on an appointed day to meet with, quote, a very high government official who was interested in Malcolm X. I did fly down to the city. My friend accompanied me to the offices of a large private foundation. Well, Alex Haley, naming the names, you now must have to tell what that large private foundation was. But I will tell you it was either of two, the Rockefeller Foundation or the Ford foundation, and I suspect it was the Ford Foundation, and I'll tell you why. Because the head of the Ford Foundation at that time was a gentleman named John McCloy. John McCloy was the forerunner to David Rockefeller becoming chairman of Chase, as well as David Rockefeller becoming chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, because simultaneously McCloy was chairman of the Ford Foundation, chairman of Chase, and chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations on behalf of the Rockefeller family. Now, when Malcolm starts to meddle in international stuff, you got to know who got the international agenda. Such that if a trilateral commission emerged in 72, who did they kill in the 60s to make it possible? That's why we're going back to the things previously looked at and extracting those that are necessary to make a brighter future. Says, I met with the foundation president and he introduced me to the Justice Department civil rights section head, Burke Marshall. Marshall was chiefly interested in Malcolm X's finances, particularly how his extensive travel since his black Muslim ouster had been paid for. I told him that to the best of my knowledge, what was he doing telling him? I, got you, but he, I don't get it. See, I don't want you all to make the 
mistake that Alex Haley made because he might have to pay for something. Ain't no need of you going that route. It says, I told him to, to the best of my knowledge, the several payments from the publisher had financed Malcolm X along with fees he received from several speeches and possible donations that his organization received and that Malcolm X had told me he had borrowed money from his sister Ella for the current trip and that recently the Saturday Evening Post had brought the uh, con uh, condition right to the book for a substantial sum. That was soon to be received. Marshall listened in quietly, intently, and asked a few questions concerning other aspects of Malcolm X's life, then thanked me. Now, we need to know what it was that they asked. See, he's very vague in about four lines, but the whole thing to the depth could be answered about who was close enough to give certain reflections, and I say Alex Haley need to have a razor put to his throat. Now listen, this is straight up, because unless you start it, brother, this shit is out of hand. Put the, ra put the razor on his throat and say, brother, I would like for you to tell who these people are. And if the nigga act like he don't know, if he act like he don't know, after he just set up and wrote all them roots, now of course he didn't know who he stole some of that from, right? Because you know he got paid, he had to pay somebody for stealing. Now he admits on the first, he just come out of the Coast Guard for 20 years. Now we gotta start adding these things up and quit letting people who penalize our people walk the streets unattended to. While we on the subject, let me add one more. When we were in Washington, D.C., I brought up the question of Carl Rowan. Why is this, why is this nigga living so peacefully? In 1964, Carl Rowan was made head of the U.S. Information Agency, not because he was a bright Negro, because someone black had to counter Malcolm X's international activity and he was going to certain countries and they went and got a Negro propagandist to go out there and say the American Negro is not represented by Malcolm X. Now if you want to know how big of a liar Carl Rowan is, pick up his recent book called Breaking the Barriers. There's not even one single mention of Malcolm X in the whole book. Now if he want to talk about his rise to the top and don't mention how he crossed Brother Malcolm to get there, then I must be Boo Boo the Fool, because I ain't letting a nigga eat good on the death of Malcolm X. In fact, in Dr. Clark's book on Malcolm X, in case y'all get weak in your spine and talk all that shit and don't decide that you want to do something about how you're feeling, there's a chapter here called The Beginning, Not the End, where Carl Rowan is quoted as saying, that we must correct this lack of information by zealous disseminating the vilification and slanders of the U.S. press designed to obliterate every memory of the slain brother. Well, that's the sister's comments about it. Said that uh, uh, Carl Rowan, director of the U.S. Information Agency, characterized Malcolm X as only, quote, an ex-convict, ex-dope peddler, and racial fanatic. That's right. He said it. And Rowan in, uh, expressed his amazement that many Africans respected and admired Malcolm X. Now, when Rockefeller went to get a trilateral commission in 72, you know he went and got that nigga and put him in it. Because he had proved his loyalty, he crossed a brother if he had to, and even shot a boy up in his yard with an illegal gun, and he's still on the set. Now, all I'm saying is, is while we're around giving Malcolm all the memory, let's accept some responsibility for clearing out the Malcolm problem by giving some pressure to the ones who pressured brother off the set. Now, that's just a little, we ain't even at the lecture yet. This just a, that was just an announcement. <laughs> now, part of what I do is uh, I may never get to give you all of the things that I have brought here, but surely I have brought them to the best I can to share with you as much of this uh, as I can. And since we are bringing up the question of intelligence collection, which is greatly underestimated in our community. We're very naive about how the spy thing work. One of the biggest hangups in our community is who is the spy? You got a bunch of people standing around not doing a damn thing, wondering which one is watching. You don't have to watch nobody ain't doing nothing. Now, now let's break it down. Too often we don't understand how the spy system work, therefore we misappropriate these. Now I suggest that if you people here in New York City 
want to see who spy on you, I suggest you walk your ass down to the United Way in your area. Yes. Now, when you get down to the United Way, you ask them to see two things. One, let me see your priority scale, meaning that. I see that commercial where you got athletes taking little uh, handicapped children on bus rides. But I understand that that's your third and fourth level priority funding. I hear that the, uh, uh, stopping aggression against authority figures and stopping racial unrest is your number one priority, even though publicly you make it look like taking handicapped children to a sporting event is what you do. Now, if you go down to United Way after you ask to see what those funding priorities are, and you will see you are the number one problem in their book, then you will see, let me see who got funded by the United Way. And when you get that list and look at what goes into those grant papers, you will then see where the guys are, because under the guise of social work, they absorb all the information they need. Now, what happens? What happens when you got the alcohol treatment specialists out there who got to identify all of the people in their neighborhood who got the alcoholism problem? Now, the people at the top ain't too worried about us sane Negroes. They want to know them ones who might like to snap and get up and do something on a moment's notice. What happens to the mental health worker who got to go out and identify all of the people who ain't acting right? You see them brothers down the street just be talking loud. They be walking all around. What well, a beast. The beast is really scared of those people because they're not afraid of the beast because what are they living for? So if you get 10, 15, 20 of them, you know sometimes they be stanky, got urine all over. Get you 10, 15 of them and go see your favorite corporate leader. <laughs> One of the things we found in Chicago was that the United Way was running an early warning system. I suggest if you go to your United Way, you'll find the same thing, and it's what it looked like. 25 organizations got together in Chicago under the guise of, quote, monitoring, developing racial tension, intelligence collection, monitoring, developing racial tension. You got to know what the language sounds like. Monitoring, developing racial tension, and proposing advanced intervention when necessary. That's the counterintelligence component to it. Now, this early warning system started at the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs in Chicago. Now, the reality is that everything that happened with me in the mayor's office was about my role in our community to be the one to translate the intelligence section for the people who were playing on the field. Now, when I identified this Jewish network that had infiltrated the Washington administration, it was not that when they got there, I spotted them, but we spotted them when they were out in the field working for the United Way as racial monitors. Uh, now, now, the worst, the worst problem of being for them with me is that I had the document. Now, we got the document because somebody went to somebody's office when they wasn't supposed to and took it. That's right. <laughs> That's how we got it. But when we got it, we made sure we used it in a way not to overexpose the spies so that they were removed, but to identify to the key players who these people were so that when they talked to them, they could talk in a way without eluding apprehension, but never something they're looking for. Now, we, we, we're going to get smart in the 90s. The organization of the 90s is covert action. Right? Okay? Let's go do it. Now, let's follow this because this is important because we're going to clear away us and them and then we're going to get on with the details. Race Trouble Warning System Bar. Get this article, Chicago Sun-Times, May 29th, 1981. It's about William French Smith, who was the Attorney General at that time, declaring that Reagan was about to cut all of the social programs, but before they would do that, they had to infiltrate the communities keeping their finger on the pulse of the American cities, as he's quoted as saying. Now, you know when you go to the doctor, the first thing the nurse does is say, give me your hand. Because when they check your pulse, they vouch for your vitality. So if someone is attesting to the pulse of the nation's cities, they're responsible for identifying its vital parts. You got to get the language. Now, he says that he'll be you the Community Relations Service of the U.S. Justice Department to pull it off. Now, if the federal government's regional office is in New York for the East Coast, is it? 
If you go down to your federal building, you will go to an agency within the Justice Department called the Community Relations Service. Go there and say, let me see your brochures, give me all that stuff. You will see that they say that they are conflict resoluters. Look out for that language. Conflict resolution. That's, let me look up your butthole and see if you've had enough. That's what that means. Because they ain't coming from the beast to resolve no conflict. They coming to resolve your conflict. Now, that article will pinpoint for you that the Community Relations Service has been alerted to keep their finger on the pulse of the nation's cities. Everywhere in every region, the Community Relations Service monitors your community. So you ought to go down there and get an idea of what they're finding out. Now, the United Way, this is the grand paper from the United Way, and when you look to the board of your United Way, name the names, when you look to the board of your United Way in New York, I'm sure you're going to see it's Rockefeller dominated. Now, it's Rockefeller dominated in Chicago. And what you will look at is that the major corporate leaders in that area sit on the United Way board so that when those organizations write up those little monthly reports that go to their director, that go from their director down to the agency downtown, those in one spot to go into one program development book, in reality, these are the eyes and the ears for the board members who can't go to the meetings for failure of being identified. So they operate in the social service arena. Now, when they went to get, they said that they would give them a grant to go away and get 25 organizations who would be the eyes and ears. In fact, I thought it was ironic. I was just on the campus of Howard University, and the uh, Howard Se University Security put a flyer. The flyer don't say shit. It just says Howard University Security Division, and it has an eye and an ear. But you see, in reality, that's intelligence collection talk. If you want to tell on somebody, because you heard something or saw something, call this fucking number. But that's the language. That's the language. That's the language. Now, they got 25 organizations in Chicago to serve as the early warning system. And I want to read you because most of these are national organizations. And they're not doing one thing in Chicago and doing something else in New York. American Civil Liberties Union. American Jewish Committee. American Jewish Congress, Anti-Defamation League, Chicago Urban League. Now, Chicago United is the major black-white business civic group. Now, they got one in every city. In Detroit, it's called New Detroit Incorporated. In fact, the white boys finance African, African Liberation Day up there. I, there's so much white finance African Liberation Day, I don't know how all Africans can stand all that assistance. <laughs> Anyway, you probably have one here. I don't know what it's called. I will by the next time I get back here. I don't know, what's the name of that white black business group? Gotta be one. These are the civic advisors to the mayor. You know, like, Dinkins, now you better get this shit right now. We sending Rohat over there, and you ain't gonna get this money because you ain't acting right now. Do it have a name? New York Partnership, that's the shit. I heard that shit before, that's it. Now, now, now check this out. Also, the Chicago Department of Human Relations. Now, let me go back. Every city got a Department of Human Relations. Check it out. What does it do? It does what is called rumor control. Rumor control. <laughs> now, what is rumor control? They out scouting out who the fuck has had enough and who gonna go kick the master in the ass. So they call it rumor control law. So you got one here. Now, in LA, they had a LA Commission on Human Relations. That's the shit that Karinga was wrapped up in with Rabbi Wolf and Jewish Kenny Hahn that he still ain't got up, out of today. Oh yeah, we got the documents. And we done rose it with the people, so don't feel like you can run and tell him. He say, oh yeah, he's out there now, huh? Because we gotta get these things cleared away so we can get on with the other business. Let me go through some more names. Uh, Citizens Information Service, which in Chicago is the information arm of the League of Women's. Citizen Schools Committee, which is, you all got a thing here called the American Jewish Committee on Public Schools. Or the, see, they set something up here on public school finances. The Coalition on Public School Finances, some, because when they set up the Chicago one, it was set up on your New York one. Financed by Exxon, Rockefeller Foundation, all the same old Rockefeller agents. 
Uh, and here is the Community Relations Service, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs. Now, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs is run by a white woman named Jane Ramsey. Jane Ramsey is now the head of the new Jewish agenda in the Midwest region. The reason I mention her name is because, thank you, brother. The reason I mention her name is because you'll see her floating around here in New York. Now, there's one thing that happened. When I got fired in Chicago, they used six tapes that I had made at the Nation of Islam. Now, what was in the tapes that scared them up was that when they got to the tapes, they all heard their names. <laughs> right? Now, the perception is, is that you all might not know you need to know about these names. Okay, let's just, let's just do a little check here. Uh, who runs the International Monetary Fund? Give me the name of the head of the International Monetary Fund. Who? Who? No. No. Okay, who heads the World Bank? Who? No. That's three heads ago. Come on now, Africans. How many of y'all in here love Africa? Now, if you talk to an African, they will tell you that they're getting kicked in the ass by the IMF and the World Bank. Now, the white man say, I was in the room, and again, I heard Copley ask the black community who run the major monetary institutions, and again, they did not know. Don't feel bad. They didn't know at Howard. They didn't know at University of Maryland. They didn't know at George Washington U. They didn't know at Howard Law School. They didn't know at UCLA, Northwestern University of Minnesota, University of Kansas, San Diego State, but they didn't know when we was with the African group in California, they didn't know in Chicago, they didn't know at the slave. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm an informational doctor. I got to make sure the patient's sick before I can go ahead and do my work. <laughs> now, everybody is swear we don't need to name no names, but when I go around, ain't nobody got none of the key ones. Now watch this here. Who bust the Douglas? <laughs> Who Mike Tyson? Who uh, Hulk Hogan? Yeah, y'all know that shit, right? The heavyweights of nothing. <laughs> and see, I say it ain't no accident our people don't know the key stuff. We done been to a whole lot of meetings, we done forked up a whole lot of dough, and we know everything but who's in control. And they hate me. They hate me when I come, because if nothing else, I will sacrifice the best I can to give you the footprints that you can go look for yourself. I ain't asking you to follow me nowhere. Now, now, y'all remember that Ollie North plan? Y'all yeah. remember that? Well, who was they they was going to pull that off? What was the name of that agency? And what was they going to do? They was going to incarcerate them. Now, let's see how the blacks feel about that. Who run FEMA? Look, the head of FEMA got a house, a family, and some children. You know yours, and you don't know his. So he ain't personally threatened by all the shit we talk, all the shit we wear, all the accusations we throw on each other, because he know we don't know a damn thing. And we act like we do, which makes us more dangerous to each other than we think. We're being victimized by people who tell us they on the point when in fact they can't get paid if they name the names. That's why I'm the least paid one on the circuit. I'm glad that the slave theater looking out for me. Because if the slave don't know, who will? Now, let me go through the rest of these names. So the 25 eyes and ears for white supremacy in Chicago. Everybody know about white supremacy. I remember one day I had Neely Fuller corn it. Well, nearly. Yeah, Steve. Oh, uh, now that we got that cold book on white supremacy, let's get that cold book on white supremacist. Francis, I remember I used to tell us about that Jewish woman who told you that there was someone out to get us. Give me that bitch name. Because when we put the razor to our throat, if she don't tell us where the meat is, then we can quote about her funeral. Now check what I'm saying. We got people telling us about things white people are telling us, but they ain't giving us their names. Either they mythical people or they spread the shit for them. Now somewhere, while we're in pursuit 
of the illness that plagues our body, we're going to have to get specific. What problems could you run into when you don't get specific? You could have a toothache and a podiatrist could show up. Yeah? That's a doctor. It's just the wrong location for the problem. Now, when you go to the doctor, you say, Doc, oh, I feel so bad, I uh, hurt all over. Doc say, well, you got to give me some specifics. You say, well, Doc, I hurt all over. He said, well, here, motherfucker, here, two Tylenol. <laughs> and you got to take that shit every four hours. Now, when you say it's somewhere in your stomach around the other side of your navel on the lower right side, you say, well, hon, that could be your appendix, your liver. Let me now begin to specify the six or seven alternatives as we narrow down what it is that you're ailing from so that we can get you the right remedy. That's all that naming the names will do is get you the remedy to the disease that you're suffering from. Now, people will say, well, Steve, surely we're not going to hurt these. Well, let me see if we can add this up. I'm a doctor. And you come to me, and you got, based on the examination, you got a living, growing, negative bacteria eating up your living cells. And I tell you, I can give you two things. I can give you some, some, some what do they call that stuff, Thorazine, uh, Novocaine, uh, 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 Valium, and I can numb the pain that you're feeling. Or, or, we can go in there, have an identified location of the bacteria and actually take this bacteria out because my forecast is that if you don't stop this living evil negative thing eating up the living part of your cell and your soul that it will kill you if you don't kill it. Now everybody don't want to hear that. That means that we're suffering from a disease that's growing and living and we must kill it to resolve the problem. But don't feel bad because considering to kill you is a crime. Is that right, brother? And I say someone is conspiring to kill you. I am presenting to you the promo facie on the surface that it appears to be true of who done it. And we need to have a trial. And we need to come to some consensus about whether it is or whether it ain't because as long as it's vague, I ask it's dead. Now, let me just say this. This has got to be clear. You see, they got an agenda too. They working off signposts, and they working off strategy, and if they're in the dominant position, then their agenda might be more important than ours. Because they feed us, they clothe us, they teach us, we use their cars. You know, people say, oh, go Coakley. I ain't in no control, no white man. I said, nigga, when the light turned red, your ass stopped. <laughs> and what's interesting is that as I go to these places and tell people, quit stopping at the red light all the time, people, when they, I, I'm getting the car right, so they don't want to show me that they're going to get to the red light, that they get to edging on out there and driving on past it. After they look it out real good, everybody don't want to get caught at four in the morning, standing at no fucking stop sign with nobody there and no direction, just stopping because the white man say, when you see red, stop. See, his brother said, to break the mental shackles of racism, oppression, and white supremacy. That's it, it's up here. It's up here. Now, the problem is, everybody don't have confidence about who done it. So y'all pay me to go on the point to tell you who done it, you don't have the time. So we have a trade-off here. I get to go further, and you get the report. So this is my report to you, right? On who done it. You see, one's trying to kill you, and the goal is to establish who done it, right? Because then, we see some people say, well, it's still time for the white people. I say, well, you know, I think he can come around. <laughs> Do we want to reform this thing? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in that. I think that when they get to 1992 and play the 500th anniversary of Columbus discovering America, January 1st, 1992, I ask him. That's my perception. That don't have to be worth shit, but that's my perception. Now let me go ahead and finish these 25 and get on with the rest of them.
Now that I went through the white ones, let me tell you which black ones was eyes and earring. NAACP, National Conference of Christian and Jews, National Council of Jewish Women, Operation Push. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Union of American Hebrew Congregations, United Church of Christ. Now they paper, that ain't mine. Now why they hate me so is that when we get the document, we know how to pin them so that they cannot beat the stigma of not being with us, though they act like they're with us. So then you can move on. Once you neutralize the buffer, which is all intelligence is, these are not the principles. If Jesse Jackson is spying on the black community, to kill Jesse is not the goal, but to get past him is. Now we say, Jesse, you can play all the games you want. The people that know what we know will not play them with you. Therefore, we won't lose one of our team members. You provide good cover. Make the beast think we all play in politics. Politics will not whip white supremacy. Now, but if you're going to get in the way of what we're doing, then we're going to have to string you up like we would do to anybody who would have to get a necklace for informing on the others. I'm proud of Winnie Mandela. Now, since we got to Winnie Mandela, let's get clear about this. Y'all want a free Winnie Mandela? How many of y'all want free Winnie Mandela? Okay, I'm going to tell you where you can go and put some pressure, and if you put some pressure where I call his name at, you're going to get Winnie Mandela out of all of the charges, if so, fact so. Does that mean quick? You want to know where to go? Take your ass up with him black hat long beard wearing Jewish motherfuckers is at because 80%, listen up, 80% of all the diamonds from South Africa to America stop off at the diamond district. Now, when I ask when they're fighting apartheid, do they go to the diamond district? They say, uh-uh, now something wrong. You see, all last summer, I was trying to get to you in August to go to the Diamond District to put some pressure, and a whole lot of Negroes come out to block me. Because they get paid to keep you away from the damn Diamond District. You don't think, oh, but ask how many times you've been there, and when you think about it, when I go through the Diamond Connection and how Diamonds is predominantly a Jewish connection, and Lord Rothschild and Cecil Rhodes set up a secret society that took the diamonds and gold in Azania, went through Europe and organized the Europeans on the leg of colonialism. When I hooked the diamond dealers into the game, you'll wonder why you've never been there. Then you'll have to ask the ones that you follow. Because, because I say they know enough not to go there. You want a free mini Winnie Mandela? Go to the damn diamond district. We'll get into them in a few minutes. We got to do it. We got to do it. Now, let me, let me clear up some misconceptions about things happening recently. I've been down in Washington, D.C. since September, in and out, moving in and around, trying to put pressure on the location of the New World Order Police. Bush is head of the New World Order Police. So it needs to be stronger pressure in Washington because they're suffering from the same problem you're suffering from here in New York, that where the real power centers are, there is no pressure. The Klan has a meeting, 4,000 Negroes show up to fight the Klan. 27 little poor white honkies don't run shit. <laughs> Check up now, because if you get to this militant revolutionary wing, they always want to run and fight them and lead you out there to go fight them, you jacking off on some white people that if you kill all 27, wouldn't run shit. Probably get two pickup trucks, some pass-through bills, some old stanky pork and some other pork belly, some old shit you wouldn't want. But the World Bank and the IMF and the G7 just met in D.C. that nobody show. Why? Because don't nobody equate the World Bank, the IMF, and the G7 with running nothing because they never got the lesson into who controlled it. Now, I say that ain't no accident. Now, they had some riots in Washington, D.C., right? The word was, by Sharon, I'm an American, Dixon, is that that was a Hispanic riot. Said the Hispanics went off in Washington, D.C. 
Well, the only problem was it was 295 people arrested and only 26% of them were Hispanic. 56% of them were young black males between 18 and 22. But it was a Hispanic riot because the only way Sharon can get paid is to make the white people at the New World Order Police Unit think she got it in control. And if you don't know nothing else about Mary and Barry, just know that when it comes to calling the police on you, the white people were unsure if he would do it. So they got them someone they could depend on. You got it? That's why Harold Washington ain't here. Because they couldn't depend upon him to do what was necessary. Now, if any of you people don't leave early, because I know you got something to do when this shit go down, there's some tapes in the back. There's some tapes in the back of some of the things that I talk about. There's a lot of things back there that are a lot of details go into things beyond what I could tell you. So if it is that you gotta go, make a stop up there in that right-hand corner, do some business with me, because I guarantee that the money you'll give for the tape will be a fair trade. Now, that's all it is. It's only for those who need it. Everybody don't need it. See, I ain't for everybody come in and say, I love everybody, and I come in peace. I do not come in peace. <laughs> That's what's wrong. We peacing ourselves to death. Peace, brother. Peace, brother. Peace. Well, why the fuck is going to be so much peace when we got so many problems? <laughs> hey, right. No justice, no peace. I heard somebody say that earlier on the radio. And the reality is, that's true. There'll be no peace with the beast. Now, let's, let's, let's get on with the details. Uh -huh. In fact, I was listening to the news today. You all got a hospital here called St. Francis Cabrini? Well, they had on the news today that St. Francis Cabrini now, for every child that's born in this hospital, mandatorily gives each child a DNA gene print of their blood, which is produced into a universal product code identification card. Check it out, the St. Francis Cabrini they're the first to offer it. The doctor says to this date, no one has refused their universal product code ID, which is now being given. And there's a company called Life Bank Incorporated, keep your eye on them, who are selling it, are offering doctors $40 for every person that they can get to get this print. You know, they used to give you baby print, footprint. They say they got a problem with so many lost children that now they got to use the product code. Don't you believe that? But that's a whole nother subject. Now, we're going to talk about, this is what we got to talk about before I finish. We got to talk about Skull and Bones, the secret society that Bush is there. We got to talk about the Masons and how it interrelates with Skull and Bones. And then we got to talk about the Boule, which is the black male component that interrelates with the Skull and Bones and the Masons. So we got, we got to head that way. Let's start over here. Let's see. We're going to do our best. Though. We're going to do our best. We'll do our best. Don't, everybody don't want to hear this. I know how you can wait all your life to this and have to go home and see the news. <laughs> well, that's all right. See, what they do is they wait for their moment and they feed an impression. See, you can sit. You can sit for so long, then it gotta be the, gotta make the move. Now, let's see if we can get some clarity here. Now, I gotta tell you about something you gotta get hip to. There's a war going on in the white community, and you got to get up on it. The war is between the Anglo-Saxons and the Zionists. They got a little thing going on. How the thing got going was, was that in the Persian Gulf War, Bush boys tried to check the Israeli boys. The Israeli boys begged up on the 10 billion to help them with the settlement, saying they wouldn't. Now, when we get in it, when you get to the bottom, at that time I was doing this stuff, 75, 76, 77, Bush was head of the CIA. Now, as I bought every book I could on the FBI and the CIA, I kept seeing how they carried out the agenda for the white supremacists. But I didn't see the thought rationale because the FBI and the CIA not the question of why shall we do this, but having been given the instruction that we shall do this. Take. Now, the point to that is, is that these are the henchmen. Remember I mentioned the informants or the intelligence collection system is really the henchmen or the buffer between us and them. Now, 
Then I found a book called The CIA and the Court of Intelligence by Marx and Marchetti. There's one page, one graph in that book that says that the principal constituent of the CIA is the CFR. Now that was important because that then led me to the Council on Foreign Relations, which of course is headquartered here in New York. When was the last time there was a protest at the Council? Oh no, y'all bullshit. Y'all know y'all jabbing me now. I know, I know y'all jabbing me that there had to have been a protest at some time over at the Pratt House or Chatham House, whatever the fuck it's called. I know y'all had, when y'all was mad about Africa, y'all didn't go there? When y'all was hollering for Mandela, y'all didn't go there? You mean when y'all was hollering for a liberate, y'all didn't go there? Oh, y'all got to stand outside of their meeting one night with your cameras. Just stand there. Brothers went down to the own commission office down there at 346 East 46th Street today, where the ADL is at, trilaterals there, foreign policy association. You can't even, as a black man, get through the lobby. Scout these things out because we coming back. See, I think y'all might be asleep up in here. I don't mean up in here. I mean up in the city. That somehow somebody don't want you to touch the crown jewels. You get the impression that they may be leading you away from somebody. So maybe we with the United Nations and the Diamond District and the Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral ADL offices ought to find enough points to push some pressure, which things we'll name later, and we might can make a difference in our lives. So when I got to the bottom of those CIA activities and FBI, I only got led to the CFR. Now when I was looking up Bush, for example, Bush just happened to be on the board of the CFR too. So huh, head of the CIA on the board of the CFR. So then I look back historically, there's Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles was head of the CIA and was one of the founding members of the CFR way back in 1921. Now this again, with his brother John Foster, who was Secretary of State while he was CIA director. You also had the McGeorge Brundy and the William Brundy connection. That's New York too. You gotta also get into the Harriman connection and the Winston Lord connection. Now all of these, the Whitney connection and the Rockefeller connection, all these things in a lot. And once we name their names, ain't no new names going to show up. See, new names showed up like Borsky and Milliken and movies like Wall Street where you identified someone who was causing you a problem and after you played the movie before the people, then you went and kicked their ass. See, the Predators, little Jewish Turks who weren't in the combine, in the agreement, went out and started buying corporations that were the family jewels. Now this is big white finance. You gotta pick up white on white conflict. Because part of you will get past is you will know how to split the opposition by clearly knowing it. See everybody's talking about, who will be in trouble if Quayle is president? Shit, bring that white boy on. If that will bring confusion, then bring us Quayle. I'm for Quayle for president. Now, Milliken and Borsky, they didn't make it, right? Because they was touching the jewels and they wasn't in on it. So after they put the movie out with Charlie Sheen and Michael Douglas and showed how they set up a rich boy who gets too big for his britches, then went on and busted their ass and put them both in jail. But they put the movie out there first for you. So that when you saw it, you'd understand it a little better and wouldn't rise your attention. Now, the only way George Bush could be president was that if there was some blood to be spilled. You see, the Trilateral Commission, for example, didn't start until 1972. But you had to do some shit in the 60s to make 70s come about. Now, between 62 and 64, almost every major leader in the world changed 70. Go check it out. Of course, America's changed in 63 with Kennedy being shot in the head, assassins still unknown. We know Oswald didn't do it because they still wouldn't be holding all that stuff till 2025 before they tell you if a dead man did it because they just wash it all on the dead man. You know what you do with a dead man? You throw all the beefs on them. But they sent Jack Rubenstein, Jewish gangster from Chicago, changed his name to Ruby, went down there and silenced the killer for the mafia Jewish Anglo connection. 
Now we know in 63 the CIA and the mafia was working together, trying to kill Castro, who's still alive. And when they didn't do it and had to tell Giancana, Roselli, and all the rest of them got killed while Castro lived. Okay? Now, so John Kennedy, he stopped fucking up the program. He fucked with the Bay of Pigs thing. He wanted to audit the Federal Reserve. And as a white Irish boy, he went and tried to go buy him some niggas up in the Carlisle Hotel, as Malcolm told us. But the white boy was trying to play crossover music, and it wasn't time for that yet. So he, as an Irish, remember, is still exploited by the British today. So when the bitch queen show up, the Kennedy boy walk out. But the Kennedy's in trouble anyway. Still. Right? Now, how would Bush become president if it was John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy? How was he going to get in there? Right? So they, they did it until they got him there. Now, remember, the Kennedy thing is hedged in the Warren Commission. Chief Justice Earl Warren was head of the Masons of all of California. Right? Got to pick up on that. And Alan Dulles was on the Warren Commission with Gerald Ford and John McCloy. All these names start all weaving together. Well, what did the Warren Commission do? It said that one bullet went through Kennedy's head, turned 90 degrees, did a dip and a loop, and we went into Conley, went through his shoulder, arm, leg, fall on the stretcher without a knot on it. That's the bullet. George, uh, Gerald Ford was the major proponent of the magic bullet theory. Eventually became the unelected president, selected your governor as vice president. Rockefeller, right? Isn't that how he got there? Before he died, Saxon with Meekin. And they put his clothes on him for they call ambulance. Now, let's see if we can get this right. So, if you look at Nixon's book called R.N., you will see Rockefeller say that Kennedy wasn't going to make it to the election in 63, even though he was leading all the polls. What did Rockefeller know? Nixon said, well, Dad, he's leading all the polls. Ross said, don't you worry about it, he ain't going to make it. And that's in one of them two R.N. books by Richard Nixon. That's important. Now, so the killing come down in Dallas and they neutralized the guy. What's this here, bro? <laughs> They didn't get it. Nah. Okay. Uh, hey, see, you always say don't drink. No drink, you don't pour. Now, I love these buzz. I trust them. But it just, it's just a thing you got to do. I, I, was in one, I was in California once giving a lecture. Giving a lecture, and a guy walked right in from outside, walked right through the front, right up to the stage, and dropped a drop of water, a can of water, right? I had never seen him ever. He wasn't one of the hosts. Nobody had knew him. He dropped the and walked right out the room, right out the stadium, and kept right on going. Now, I'm still looking at that water. And when you look at the videotape, you see everybody going crazy, because I'm saying, who was that guy? And everybody, you watch everybody say they didn't even know. And all he had was from thirst quencher from him. <laughs> right? <laughs> hey. Now, anyway, let's go ahead on. So now, the Kennedy boy gets shot. Now, just remember this. The bullet comes from the front, right? Whips his head backwards. The brains go out the back of his head on the back seat of the car. But Oswald from the back. So how do the bullet from the back take the brains out and send the brains backwards? That, that beats the law of physics. But here's the deal. OK, so we killed the motherfucker. What you going to do? That's the deal to the Kennedy family. OK, now let's move on. So, okay, so here come Malcolm X. What is Malcolm X doing? He's on the international set trying to build an international grassroots movement. This grassroots movement would kick any trilateral commission in the ass because we would have an international counter group so that if they went international, we had a grassroots, grass community way of counteracting what they were doing. 27 years later, we still do not have one. And right before Malcolm died, they stopped him from going to France. That was the State Department. Who was running the State Department? Dean Rusk, who had come from chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation to Secretary of State and is a Rhodes Scholar. The Rhodes Scholar connection is important because those are the soldiers of Cecil Rhodes to fulfill the obligations of his secret society, most quoted in Encyclopedia Britannica, if you need a good white source. Now, Okay, 
Now, you had to go to Malcolm before you got to Martin because if you went to Martin first, you would give more credence to Malcolm's theory. Malcolm called out the World Bank right there. We still love him, but we don't know who run it. He called him out. He called out the Carlisle Hotel, the Big Six. Malcolm named the names. That caused some problem. Now, you go get that little Robert Kennedy and Martin King, they stirring up all that war mess. They had some goals for that thing. So they were stirring it up, so they took him out. But the goal was, okay, so we shot him. So we shot him. What you gonna do? See, I think the people who we looked up to did not tell us that they already know who did the killing, but they didn't believe they had the power to do what had to be done to the ones that did the killing. So they win because they're violent, right? Just, just when they're down on their luck and the shit don't work, they just go and kick a little ass. And you gotta understand that because that's why we use this little bogart as a symbol. Let me see your elbows up, let me see your elbows up. Now, when you see me, and you want to make me understand that you know what I'm saying, greet me like this. <laughs> Bogart, right? And see if we can bump them together. Right, Bogart, right? Now, why? Because subliminally, we want to accept the mindset that they took it, and the only way we're going to get it is to take it back. That's all. That's all it is to it. And we, we, we must set the climate to make this possible because the climate is, is that we can't do that. Now, someone says, you know, man, would they kill us? Shit, they killed a whole race of people. Right up in here. Killed a whole race, and then we still wondering if the jury's still out on them. They kicked their ass and took their land. Right? Didn't they? Y'all been dancing with wolves lately? And boy, you know, when the movie was over, the white people be sitting in the theater, boy, they don't want to move. Because now all of a sudden they say, damn, they might remember we did all of this. They put their head down and shit. They don't want you to remember what all they done. That's why they got them little civil rights leaders now. Leadership Council on Civil Rights, still jacking off with a civil rights bill. 27 years after Malcolm called them out as a hoax of white people, when they got the first 600,000, 800,000, correct me, strike for the record, correct Okay? That the record reflect is 800,000, and the Negro organization is still a day, and when you read their fly, they say, we represent 290 somewhere. Shit, nigga, if you had 290 people, you'd be lucky. <laughs> Talking about we represent these many organs, then why can't you do shit? <laughs> now, okay, so, now, it just come out in the Washington Post, and it's coming out in this book that's out now, that now they have been able to come out with who Deep Throat really was. Y'all know who the name was? It was Al Hay. But now let's go back. Now we got to check this shit out. It's getting deep. We're about to get down to who doing this shit all the time. Now let's go back. Al Haig was a four-star military general that got up the ranks exceedingly fast on the request specifically of Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger specifically is the agent of his godfather Nelson and now supervised by his brother David, who has Kissinger for the Republicans and Brzezinski for the Democrats. Correct? Okay. Now, so Kissinger in his book, the White House thing, first page, gives all honor and respect to Nelson, who picked him up from obscurity and let him think about his power. Now, Haig worked for Kim. So the word is out now that Haig was deep throat. Well, you we gotta go back, because there's some deep evidence. How many of y'all seen Spiro Agnew's book? Y'all remember Spiro Agnew? What was he? Now, how did he leave office? He resigned, right? Well, he wrote a book. His book was called Go Quietly, dot, 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 or else. <laughs> now, you can't find it nowhere. And the reason you can't find it is that the people bought all of his book, him up, and you ain't heard one word from him since. He lives in Palm Springs, California, and I'm dying to talk to him. But what he says in his book, you must know, is that when it came time to Watergate Nixon, and he had been Watergated, that they looked down and figured out that Agnew would become president. 
And they said, give me that file on Spiro. Got the file and say, uh, Spiro, come over here. Come here, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, Spiro, uh, who is governor of Maryland? You stole some money. He said, he said, he said, he said, damn, chief, you knew that when you put me here. He said, you're right, Spiro. We don't let nobody up here unless we got something on them. Dinkins? 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 Oh, my God. Then, no, we're going to get to Dinkins when we get to Boulay. Boulay mean advisor to the We got to ask that nigga, who in the fuck is the king he be serving? But we'll get to that. We got to get to that. Y'all might have to go before I get to that, but I'm going to get to that tonight. Because you see, beyond the tapes that I got to sell, that this tape will be available tonight, right? And so you'll want to take it home and let everybody hear it because they can say, I said it. And then I'll quote you the sources for it so they can, you can pull the source out and look at it with them as they say, duh, about what it was I was trying to do. Okay, let me go ahead on. Agnew reviewed his book when he got to Chicago, Chicago Tribune, March 31st, 1981. Now, I had an article to show you, but they stole it when I left Washington last going to Dallas. See, when I went to Hampton, Virginia, and did the lecture on Bush and Skull and Bones, when I got to the airport in Washington, they stole my bags with my research in it. In there was the only article I had on the Agnew thing. I know what the article says, but I bring it to show you. See, I know my stuff, right? But I bring it for you because you might not want to believe me. Somebody say, oh, that nigga talk a lot of shit, you know. He, had, he ain't so shit. Didn't just talk all that old shit, you know. I never talk shit. The problem that they have with me is I quote the white people to prove who done it. Because they had to tell so that they could get respect from each other. Right now, check this out. Agnew in the Chicago Tribune, March 31st, 1981, tempo section says, Spiro Agnew says it was quietly dot, 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 or be assassinated. And they said, well, Spiro, who was it that said they would assassinate you? He said it was Al Haig, who told me that if I didn't leave the White House right then, they was going to shoot me in my motherfucking head. Now, Agnew had several choices. He had already seen the files on the Kennedy thing because that's what E. Howard Hunt and Richard Helms were blackmailing Nixon about that made Watergate come about was, look, Nick, if you won't tell what we want, then we're going to tell you was in Dallas that day, working for Pepsi-Cola. How many of them niggas got them Pepsi-Cola franchises? <laughs> Dr. Basketball players and shit. Yeah, well, they need to quit selling that shit. It ain't even good for you. Anyway, anyway, now, so Agnew identified Haig as the one who was going to kill him. Now, that's heavy drama. Why has Haig not been brought before the court for attempted murder? For the same reason that's now being revealed he was deep throat. He was so powerfully connected that when he gave the word, you know it was from the word up top. Agnew says that he didn't know who Haig was working for. He think he came from a higher authority. But Agnew was vice president. Haig was just chief of staff. But he worked for a higher authority. But this is consistent because when Ronald Reagan got shot, who came to the podium and said, I am in control here in the White House? Did he? Well, I lay before you the premise that Haig may have something to do with who been doing it. And I got white boys to say he do it. Ain't that right? Do it there? Can I move on? Okay. Now remember, Reagan got shot in front of the Capitol Hilton on his way to be the New York Times Speaker of the Trilateral Commission meeting. Because in the New York Times, April 20, 1981, Haig's story about the speech he gave replacing Reagan was put public in the New York Times 21 days after he gave it, March 31st, 1981. Now, these are details, you can look them up. But I'm telling you these because I'm laying to you a, doc a documented flow. Now, now check this out. What happened when Reagan got shot? Reagan got shot, his wife 
scared. She turned to the horoscope woman. She wouldn't let him do a damn thing until they got it checked out with the horoscope. Now let's see what her options were. She could have called the CIA. She could have called the FBI, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, the Army Intelligence, Navy Intelligence, Navy, the Marines. She could have called any one of them and got extra protection for her husband, but she called none of them. She turned to the horoscope, like, now what is horoscope but the science that the Africans taught that Europeans picked up on? Are they telling us that in times of the crunch, they turn to sciences beyond themselves? We got to hear them carefully. But this is very relevant to today because it was not known publicly about the horoscope woman until Donald Reagan, the chief of staff, former secretary of the treasurer, came out and wrote a book called For the Record. Get the book. Now I'm following this. I'm laying my documents. I, I was numbering them. I wouldn't call that exhibit number 20 something. I think that's about where I'm at. <laughs> now, that exhibit will show that as Chief of Staff and Secretary of Treasurer, Reagan never once told Reagan what to do. Now that's heavy, you the president, and you ain't never told your Chief of Staff what to do or your Secretary of Treasurer. So if he wasn't checking in with him, who check in with? Now, in his book, he was so pissed at Nancy that he told about the horoscope lady. But then Nancy got her turn and wrote a book called, what was Nancy's book called? My Turn, correct. And in her turn, she said there was a bunch of scoundrels around my poor little Ronnie trying to take his presidency. Right? Ain't that right? Reagan wasn't lying when he said he didn't know what happened in Iran country. Wasn't nobody telling him shit. Said, that's all right, Ronnie, we got it covered, man. Here's some jelly beans, motherfucker, fall off the horse, do whatever you want. Now check it out. Now let's, let's follow this through because this is, this is white war still going on now. So Nancy been out there and Ronald been out there telling some shit about what was going on when they was really in the White House. So you know what they did? They said, hey, get that kitty bitch out here. We got an assignment for her. Kitty, come on out here. Look, this Nancy and Ronald talking too much shit. Here's a couple of million. Go dig that shit up and kick their ass. Now it's going on right now. But check out, don't get misled by it, right? Kitty Kelly comes out and says, that Ronald Reagan, sometimes, but mainly his wife, Nancy, and Frank Sinatra was meeting in the back of the White House off the record. Now don't get misled with the sex theory. No, that meeting was not about sex, those meetings. It was about Ronald Reagan feeling that his only real ally was the mafia. There you go, and if you go back and read that book about Lewis Wasserman, W-O-R, Channel 9, MCI, and Ronald Reagan, he been with the Mafia for 40 fucking years. To show you right. Now, let's, let's, let's put it together. So, Nancy is meeting off the record with Frank, because in Frank's pockets are the dialogue from the Mafia boys in Palm Springs making request, personal request of their friend Ronald, which cannot be called in on a telephone. What they busted up with the Kitty Kelly revelation was the communications network between the Mafia and Ronald Reagan, and they one step from telling, and they're just warning them we will tell if we have to. Now this is real war. But now let's follow it through because the shit's still going on, so? They fight that out, Kitty Kelly comes out, and now George Bush and his team feel comfortable that they're about to dump Quayle and his team. Quayle represents the network, a part of a deal. Let's go back. Ronald Reagan wins the Republican convention, but at the convention, due to the request of five people, Trilateral Commissioner Alan Greenspan, Trilateral Commissioner, head of the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, recently resigned as governor of Illinois, James Thompson, Kissinger, Gerald Ford, and uh, who that fifth one? I'm, I'm, missing a, uh, 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 I'm missing one more. It was five trilateral commissioners meeting 
with Reagan that made him come down and announce that George Bush was his vice president. So they cut a deal. Reagan would take Bush, Bush would take Quayle. That's the offsetting deal. It's a coalition amongst whites to keep the pressure on the blacks. But the coalition is getting fragile. Now, I checked it, boy. When Bush got sick, you know how Quayle used to just walk. Boy, when Bush got sick, that mother was going. <laughs> he was happy. But let's get it, let's get close to this. Bush is doing great after the Persian Gulf War, but the Jewish elements feel like he done boxed them in. So what happens? The Washington Post starts the process, Jewish network newspaper, the Graham Meyer family, hooked into Lazar Ferez, Eugene was, was a husband, hooked into Lazar Ferez, they got Felix Rohat standing on your neck. That's good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh. We're going to get to them. They're coming because they in it too. Now, they start writing articles on Skull and Bones. Check August 18th, Newsweek. There's an article called The Code of the Wasp Warrior. Code of the Wasp Warrior. And it's about Bush, Henry Stimson, Skull and Bones, and the wasp need to have a war to prove their white manhood. But it's about a Jewish magazine telling it. And an organization, Skull and Bones, that has few Jewish people in it. So the Jewish elements expose these Anglo elements, where in the past they've had cooperative relationships. We're talking about one year away from their 500th anniversary of worldwide supremacy. They are developing minor conflicts that need to be undermagnified and exploited and have something to do about the strategic moves we must make. See, we need to talk about these things every day, keep a barometer of what they're doing so that we can accurately keep up with what's our responsibility. Now, they come out, they come out with an article. I'm going to show you the article. I got it up here. Just came out in the Washington Post uh, on Skull and Bones. Here it is here. It appeared uh, April 16th, 1991, Washington Post, Tuesday. Here's an article right here, Skull and Bones at Yale. First, no women, now no club. That's an article right here from my friends in the back. See a nice big old Skull and Bones on the front page. And it says, it's just one line in here I think is important. And it says, right in the second paragraph, for more than a century and a half, Skull and Bones, who initiates include the late Henry R. Luce. Luce, of course, was time, life, and all of the other planks of, the, of that uh, uh, co combine, right? And his wife was Claire Luce Booth. Go back and check what they had to do with the Kennedy assassination. They was killing his ass like the rest of them. But that's, they got to check these succeeding networks. It says here, for more than a century and a half, Skull and Bones, whose initiates include the late Henry R. Luce, Potter Stewart, as well as President Bush, has been the most powerful secret society in the nation. That's all I need to hear. Because when I'm trying to figure out who when somebody start figuring who at the top of that, that sounds like something I want to catalog. But with its ceremonial phrases and clandestine rites, it is also one of the last. Which means others didn't survive, but don't fall for that. The Jewish network got theirs too. Now, how does that connect? They start a saying that Skull and Bones want to let some women in. In fact, Newsweek then did the follow-up article the next Newsweek. Now, the interesting thing, in fact, they just did it on Washington TV. They just did an article showing the 15 members of Skull and Bones at Yale having a meeting about trying to let the women in. Surprisingly, there were three brothers in the group. Show them walk right in the room. Had their hats all turned to the side and had dungarees on, was pimping and stuff. Huh, I, I got to get to figure that one out. But they wanted to put women in, so they closed the clubhouse. In fact, the Washington Post put a picture of that clubhouse there called the tomb. See, that clubhouse is called a tomb. Now, a tomb is somewhere where you got what? The dead. In fact, when you're going through the initiation rites of Skull and Bones, you got to lay your ass in a coffin. Now, I think that's ironic because one of the things I talk about is 
that our job is like Dracula. We're trying to kill Dracula. We got to suck him out into the light. Because in the light, Dracula is impotent. He got to do all his dirty work at night. And when the light comes, he got to go get back in the... Right? Now, when you in Skull and Bones, you got to lay in the coffin butt naked. And then you take on a new name. You change your name now. We need to know what Bush's name is. What his new name is. Then you got to tell about sex, all the sex you had prior to you laying in that coffin. See, in the higher rings of white supremacy, many of these circles are homosexual too. Why? Because no better secret is than a homosexual secret. Foley, a homosexual, he headed a Congress. But he only got there when they moved Jim Wright out. And they moved Jim Wright out when he tried to press the conjugate thing on Ollie North and them. And Ollie North made it and Jim Wright didn't. Ain't that right? Now, Jim Wright knew that the Tower Commission was a cover-up. And they convinced John Tower to tell it. Ooh, boom. His plane fall right out of the sky three weeks ago. Right? Am I right? Now they say his propeller got to go in too fast all of a sudden. Just like Bush Hart all of a sudden. Sound like they got some go get them gas passing them out amongst the white supremacists. Now Bush admitted today, and I thought it was heavy, that he ain't been thinking too straight lately. Today, in the news, he admitted that when Cole and other people were at the White House, he kept his answers short because his memory ain't too swell. Now that's deep. We better find out what he did the last couple of days. He might be trying to lay the excuse for some executive order that he put on us in the midst of his confusion. Pardon me? Show you right. Now this is deep. Now George Bush heart started beating fast after he went to the University of Michigan. Now in yesterday's Washington Post is an article by a guy who writes in the village voice named Nate Hottentoff or Hottentoff or something. Hentoff. Right. Well, in his column is condemning myself, Dr. Collett, and Minister Farrakhan for Farrakhan's speech in Michigan State, my speech in Michigan, and Collett's speech in Columbia. Right. And then he commit, condemned an article he put in the Village Voice two weeks ago um, and ended with me. And then the next week was about Farrakhan in Michigan State. Show you right. But we're going to go see him while we're around here because I think I need to see this guy. Yeah, brother. No better than seeing him because you get to see them faces of you who? But anyway, that's a whole nother story. Uh, now, but the point was, was that. Uh, 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 those stories were about what they call now politically correct dialogue, or PC talk. PC talk is a, something that started up at 346 East 46th Street in the Anti-Defamation League offices. Now, the Anti-Defamation League office is an international white front, all-white Jewish organization that spies on white and black communities. Nothing less. I got two, three videotapes on the Anti-Defamation League for $25. I sold out of all the audio. Their whole history is in there. But it was the ADL that took the tapes from the nation on me to the mayor and started the process of working me away from the mayor's office. But the point to it is, of course, that they also were the ones who manipulated Farrakhan's remarks in 84, etc., etc with the Nathan Pugh letter and all that, and Foxman saying one be messing with the Hebrew Israelites. Now, now, this ADL, this ADL with this International Intelligence Collection Operation, see, you always got them, they're the pushers of what are now known as anti-hate laws. Now, be leery of any black organization that comes to you and says they want to fight racial hatred that's the buzzword. We're fighting racial hatred. And they want to fight it through coming up with restrictions on dialogue because I will tell you for a fact that the anti-hate movement is nothing but a front for strangling African
Africans who are about to declare who done it. And they want to be able to call us racist when we do. You see, I'm known as a racist when in fact, as Neely Fuller said, we're counter racist. It's just a slight in terms. See, I condemn the Italians for having Columbus Day, but when I'm fired, the Italians are down there saying I'm a racist for saying Columbus was a racist. <laughs> now, I'm going to give y'all a little word while we at this spot. I'm going to be up here in October when y'all got that Columbus Day parade. And I want to get the names of every African that walk in that parade because I don't understand it. <laughs> if Dinkins got to lead it, like Harold Washington would tell you, if he was here today, I put pressure on Harold Washington for walking in the parade because he confuses the African children when we're telling them Columbus didn't discover shit because there was people here already. But no black mayor in the history of the United States of America has ever represented Columbus Day, which means that when black people become mayors of white cities, as was mentioned once in Harper's Magazine, that they have to prove they will protect white interests first. That's right, That's right brother. Which means that when they get in charge, there everybody's off Columbus Day. Everybody's off Thanksgiving. Let's see, you thank the Indians for getting you through the winter, then you went out and killed the motherfuckers. Now, I, I mean, oh, all in now, let's see, everybody won't put pressure on everybody else. Watch this here. How many of y'all work? Now, I know some more of y'all ain't. I bet you, you off that day. And I bet you, never in the history of New York, public school system, for example, has one black teacher took the little trinkets money that they got for being off that day and threw it back at the beast and say, I don't want it, I want to work that day. Yeah, now who wants it? I said, Steve, don't be taking away my holiday, man. I need the holiday. <laughs> See what happened? When it comes to fighting white supremacy and you got to give up the motherfucking money, you will take the holiday. Now, I want to get the report about how many of y'all threw the money back. But then y'all will tell me y'all down, and then when it comes down time, don't nobody want to sacrifice nothing. But then I ain't being fooled no more, because see, I, we just got to go ahead and do it whether you're in on it or not. Anyway, that was just a sidelight, but the point to it is we got to keep up with those things because they're important uh, about holidays. And you got a big Columbus statue right down here in New York, don't you? Big Columbus statue, right? I wonder how much they pay out of your money to keep it going. Yeah. <sighs> Gotta get all that white supremacy out of my system. <laughs> See, the more I talk and the better I talk, then the more white supremacy comes out. See, that stuff ain't no good. See, we be standing around, people go, <sighs> they be taking it off down the system and stuff. I said, man, that shit is waste. You wouldn't eat no boo-boo. <laughs> so when it's waste and it got to come out, let it out the quickest hole. <laughs> now, okay, let's go back to Skull and Bones. So they got this secret society that starts at Yale University in 1832. Now, what's important about that is that at that secret society in 1832, they, in fact, got a chapter or a charter from a German secret society. So that William Russell and Adol uh, uh, Alfonso Taft got a charter in Germany and brought it to the United States to Yale University. Now, many people talk about a secret society called the Illuminati. Now, it's difficult giving a report about what goes on in a secret society when you ain't in it. So when I stand up here and tell you this is the things, the best of what I can share with you, I admit that since I in it, I only know what I can pick up. I pick up the best of what's known, but then to remember that we can only pick up what, what's available. Sometimes people within do tell. Now, these two guys came here and set up a secret society. Now, we know that the Illuminati started in 1776. And many times when people say that there's no conspiracy to run the country, all you got to do is pay a dollar bill. Say, well, hold it. Let's, let's go through this a minute. Here is a pyramid with an all-seeing eye 
that underneath it says, Novus Ordo Secorum.